Okay, uh, the bell is rung several minutes ago, so we'll get going. Um, Tosin's passing out handouts, and the first thing on there, is, and I, Tosin, when you're done, or Mike, do you mind? Sorry to ask you to do something. There's uh, handouts getting printed on the printer, if you'll grab those for me. Thank you. Uh, what Mike's grabbing are the um, extras from Sunday's class try to test you here and go back and forth between two different handouts. So 40 is the one you've just gotten from Tosin. That's the one for tonight, basically. But you'll see on there that at some point we will go back and finish up what we didn't get to on uh, handout number 39 from Sunday. So the first thing on your new handout is this review from Sunday's class. So feel free to use your Bible in your handout from Sunday. Uh, and just spend a minute while people are kind of trickling in here to look over those review questions from Ezekiel 38. And we'll start with a review of what happened in 38 before we plunge ahead into chapter 39. And try to make heads and tails of Gog and Magog here. Okay, uh, I'll just have you hand us a toast and he can man both of them if you can keep up. Um, so if you need a handout from Sunday, number 39, raise your hand and Tosin has those. Uh, or if you didn't get 40 from tonight, uh, Tosin, Ms. Barbara up here needs uh, 39, I believe, from Sunday. Let's go through these review. We'll back up and go through these one at a time. So Ezekiel 38... Um, Gog and Magog, or Gog from the land of Magog, as the text says. Uh, what are Gog and his armies doing? Remember, he has an uh, army from seven nations. What are they doing uh, as chapter 38 opens up? First half of 38, what are Gog and his armies doing? Shattered out. Do you remember? They are opposing Israel. Dan, what did you say? They are attacking Israel, right? And remember that the uh, description of Gog and his armies is like the biggest army you could ever imagine. They come from all you know, these seven nations from the ends of the earth, and they are a horde that is showing up to oppose Israel, to attack Israel. And what is the situation uh, of the people or the cities in Israel, according to chapter 38? Dwelling in peace, secure. Anything you want to say about that? They are protected by God. We'll get to that. They are unwalled and unprotected uh, on their own. That's the picture of them dwelling in peace. I will say this, too, about the description of the people in uh, chapter 38, the people of Israel, because I believe this is important in the context of the book. The way that the people of Israel are described in 38 is... Uh, overlaps with or is similar to the description of what God is going to do for those exiles in earlier chapters, specifically chapters like 36 and 37. Remember, God said, I'm going to bring you back from your captivity. I'm going to settle you again on the mountains of Israel. So when 38 picks up, it's like that's been happening. The people have been back. They've been settled. They've been securely living in the mountains of Israel. And then as they're living securely, uh, Gog and this huge, terrifying army shows up to attack them. Um, what is God doing in all of this? By the end of the chapter, what, have we, what do we see about God's plan with these events? He wants to destroy Gog and Magog? Why orchestrate all of this? It's just, if he's just bringing them out to lose... Show his power for his name's sake. Remember the phrase was to vindicate his holiness. We'll talk more about that tonight. But chapter 38 is clear that God is behind this from the beginning. He's bringing Gog and Magog to Israel in order to defeat them there uh, to make a point uh, to, for the sake of his holy name. And so we've kind of given it away. But the chapter ends with uh, great action on the part of God. Um, Notice in those actions at the end of 38 that these are clearly things that he is doing. He alone is mentioned as the actor. Uh, he summons the sword. He shakes the earth. 
Uh, he makes it rain hailstones and fire and sulfur, verse 22, verse 23, to show his greatness and his holiness and make myself known in the eyes of the nations, then they will know that I am the Lord. Okay, that's chapter 38. And we continue, the story continues in chapter 39. And so what we'll do is we'll read kind of a section at a time and uh, talk about that section. And then once we finish with chapter 39, we will um, hopefully argue with each other for a little bit uh, about what to make of uh, these two chapters and what's being said. And then discuss what we are maybe to take away from all of this weird stuff uh, by the time we close. So, let's jump into 39. Again, uh, there are handouts for both tonight, uh, number 40, and 39. Uh, I think Tosin has both of those, so you can flag him down. And, showed Victoria earlier how to pull it up on your device. If you're at home or here and want to pull it up, uh, go to media on the website under Bible class material, and you'll find the Ezekiel class there. Yes, Mike. to the Israelites leaving and all the destruction that he put on Egypt. I mean, he just didn't come in and give everybody an AK-47 and say, I'm behind you, we'll take care of this. Uh, he made it very well known that he was the one behind it because of all the natural occurrences that were taking place. So I, I see a lot of similarity between those two situations and him wanting the world to know I am God and I am in control of all. Thank you, Mike. And one of the things I think you could do is, is you could go through and list out the various similarities. You know, the fire, the hailstones. I mean, there's different things you could match up there with what happened in Egypt, what happens here with Gog and Magog. And as Mike says, the point is the same, really. Okay, so into chapter 39, and uh, start with the first eight verses here, where it says that you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say... Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and drive you forward and bring you up from the uttermost parts of the north and lead you against the mountain of Israel. Then I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows fall from your right hand, and you shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your hordes and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey and every sort. Uh, and I did that on Sunday, too. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Verse 5, you shall fall in the open field, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. I will send fire on Magog and on those who dwell securely in the coastlands, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, uh, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is coming, and it will be brought about, declares the Lord God. That is the day of which I have spoken. Okay, uh, just a few things here, and then you can let me know if you have comments or questions. It is basically repeated. The opening of 39 repeats uh, the opening of 38. God is against Gog and his armies. Uh, he is bringing them out, but for the purpose of uh, exalting his name, and for defeating them. And so the armies of Gog, again, will be defeated by God. I, he says in verse 3, I will strike your bow from your left hand and your arrows from your right hand shall fall in the mountains of Israel. And uh, instead of being buried, I think we saw some of this uh, in the oracles like against Egypt back in chapter, whatever that would have been, uh, 30 to 33, or thir 29 to 32. Um, Bodies left out, bodies that are slain and left out for the birds to devour. It's a, you know, it's a picture of, of shame and, and, and embarrassing defeat and then leaving them out to be disgraced by just being food for birds and for beasts. But all of this is, again, to uh, let God's holy name be known, that it will no longer be profaned, and that all will know that Jehovah is the Holy One of Israel. Again, we'll have more to say about that by the end of the chapter, um, God's name and what he wants people to know. But any comments or questions on 39 through verse 8? Cool, easy enough. Picking up in verse 9 here as we survey chapter 39 uh, of Ezekiel. 
Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and make fires of the weapons and burn them, shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, clubs and spears, and they will make fires for them of them for seven years, so that they will not need to take wood out of the field or cut down any of the forest, for they will make their fires of their weapons. They will seize the spoil of those who despoiled them and plunder those who plundered them, Excuse me, declares the Lord God. On that day, I will give to Gog a place for burial in Israel, the valley of the travelers east of the sea. It will block the travelers, for there Gog and his multitude will be buried. It will be called the valley of Haman Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. All the people of the land will bury them, and it will, be, uh, it will bring them renown on the day that I show my glory, declares the Lord God. They will set apart men to travel through the land regularly and bury those travelers remaining on the face of the land so as to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make their search. And when these travel through the land and anyone sees a human bone, he shall set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. Hamana is also the name of the city. Thus they shall cleanse the land. Verse 17, as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to the birds Of every sort, to all the beasts of the field, assemble and come, gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you, a great sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel. You shall eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the princes, uh, eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of he goats and bulls, all of them fat beasts of Bashan. You shall eat fat till you are filled, drink blood till you are drunk, and the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you And you shall be filled at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men, and with all kinds of weapons, declares the Lord God. Okay. Um, So finally, uh, up to this point, we've only seen God acting. I mean, the, the defeat of Gog and his armies has been, God, I will strike, I will do this, uh, I will show my greatness. Finally, we see people, the people of God, the people of Israel, getting involved in the action. And uh, what kind of things do we see the people doing uh, in this section here as it pertains to Gog and his armies? The cleanup, okay? Uh, Two things in particular. The first has to do with the weapons. Now, I want you just to picture this in your head. We talked about uh, how, or we've mentioned on Sunday, just how this is described in such not only vivid, but, you know, exaggerated language. So the picture here in verses 9 and 10 is that the people of Israel go out and, you know, this huge army has been slain on their mountainsides. They go out and they collect all the weapons, the swords, the shields, the clubs, all of that. And they use those weapons for firewood. And they can keep using all that for firewood for seven years. I mean, think about the size of an army that you could collect their weapons and burn it as firewood for seven years and never need to go cut down another tree or use any wood from the stack that you have behind the house, right? Um, That's the picture here. And the people get to participate in that. And the key phrase, maybe in verse 10, is they will seize the spoil of those who despoiled them and plunder those who plundered them, declares the Lord God. That's probably the key point again. And think about what Mike said earlier about the story of the Exodus. What does that remind you of, this verse? What does this remind you of in the story of the Exodus? Yeah, <laughs> to take our stuff, right? And so, you know, the people who had been oppressed for 400 years in slavery now get to walk out with all the stuff of their captors and plunder those who plundered them. And the same principle is here, that the people get to plunder the armies of Gog who had uh, at least sought to spoil and plunder them. And then the people get involved in another way. Uh, speaking of cleanup, and they go through the land, and it is their job to bury all the bodies. So again, you're kind of stacking up images here. We already had the image of an army that's slain and simply left out on the field for the birds and the beasts to devour. Now we have another type of image, which is that these bodies are strewn about the land, and it's the people's job to go around and to bury them. And again, 
seven months, the text says, it takes to bury all these. And there's professional help that is required. There are, you know, these barriers that are mentioned. And they go through, and it's like a kind of a coordinated effort. So if you're walking along, you're searching for bodies, you see an arm somewhere or, you know, a head disembodied somewhere, you, you mark it, put a little flag by it, and then somebody's going to come by later on and make sure that gets buried. It's very elaborate how all this is described here uh, to describe the, uh, what the text says, the cleansing of the land, the making sure that all of the slain of Gog's armies are buried. Um, And then, my favorite image, perhaps, is uh, 17 to 20, where God says there's going to be a feast. Shouldn't have put it up there. Uh, Who's the feast for? The birds. Okay, so this is a little bit backwards here, because what will the birds and the beasts be feasting on? Yeah, on corpses. Okay, so typically you think of a sacrificial feast. Uh, What's getting eaten? Yeah, animals, and who's doing the eating? The, well, the people, in a, in a normal uh, setup, right? In a normal, this is a sacrificial feast that's been reversed. Here, uh, the birds and the beasts are the ones that sit at the table, so to speak, um, and what they're eating is the princes and the charioteers and the warriors of Gog and his army. So now we'd say maybe a third image is stacked. First, they were left out on the fields to be devoured Uh, just kind of by the carrion, Uh, and then there was a picture of the bodies being buried, and now a picture of the bodies again being eaten by birds and beasts, this time in a feast that's hosted by the Lord. So uh, really what's going on here is not so much the defeat. God's already accomplished the defeat of Gog's armies. Here is the disposal, we might say, of Gog's armies as they are buried and devoured. Um, Questions or comments through this very exciting section here, Mike? This is God's land. And so where on the Exodus side, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe we had any of these types of cleanups going on because it wasn't God's pe- it was God's people, but it wasn't God's land. And in this, he's wanting to get it back to the pristine, uh, pristine land because it's his land and his people. Thank you, Mike. And you may remember that kind of language back in chapter 36. Remember, 36 was the chapter addressed to the land, to the mountains of Israel. And it talked about how the land had previously been defiled, but God was going to take care of the land and make sure that it was not defiled uh, any longer. Okay? And so that connects to what Mike's saying uh, here about an effort to cleanse the land because it is God's land. Yeah, in the Exodus, I guess... Uh, the primary cleanup was done by the Red Sea, right? The, the water kind of took away, buried Pharaoh and his armies, and, you know, that was that. But, uh, yeah, here the land has to be cleansed by burying the armies. Other comments, questions, uh, just on what's being said in the text here through verse 20. Shannon. Um, uh, about the weapons being used for fuel, just kind of showing how... God takes something that's supposed to be against us and makes it for us or a useful thing for us. I thought that was interesting. Weapons, how they end up being fuel for the Israelites, something they can use. Something that was originally designed to destroy them was um, eventually going to be used in this analogy or whatever. It's going to be used for fuel for seven years. Yeah, no. Very cool, Shannon. Yeah, the turning of the, of the tables there on behalf of God's people. Let's do Ian and then Brian. Up some Tolkien reference to okay. like, sounds like like the orcs of Lord, Lord of yeah. the Rings or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. Well, don't don't tempt me. I'll think of something. So. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I just sort of think of this as a kind of an illustration of the spiritual principle that God is perfectly holy, and so we have here, in a sense, a prophetic figure of heaven because nothing unclean and unholy will be here, and so He uh, is cleansing His land of the evil men that entered into it. Thank you, Brian. So let's go uh, move on here and then um, uh, try, to, try to make some sense of this. 21 through the end of the chapter says, And I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations shall see my judgment that I have executed and my hand that I have laid on them. The house of Israel, verse 22, shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. And the nations shall know 
that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they dealt so treacherously with me that I hid my face from them and gave them into the hand of their adversaries and they all fell by the sword. I dealt with them according to their uncleanness and their transgressions and hid my face from them. Verse 25, therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel and I will be jealous for my holy name and they shall forget their shame and all the treachery that they have practiced against me. When they dwell securely in their land with none to make them afraid, when I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them from the enemy's lands and through them have vindicated my holiness in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God because I sent them into exile among the nations and then assembled them into their own land. I will leave none of them remaining among the nations anymore and I will not hide my face anymore from them when I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord. Okay, uh, so here are the conclusion. We kind of really focus in on this concept that we have been uh, seeing throughout. That this is God's glory being displayed for uh, the nations and for his people. And notice in verse 22 and 23, each of those groups is uh, mentioned and it's described here what it is that God wants these particular groups to understand. Uh, so we'll start with Israel. What does God want Israel, his people? What does he want them to take from all of this that's happened or been described in 38 and 39? I am the Lord. There's an important word here. I am the Lord, their God. Okay? I am your God. That's basically the message if you're you know, directing it at Israel. God's telling Israel, look at all of this with Gog and Magog. I am your God. Connect the dots for me here. How does all the stuff we've seen described in 38 and 39, how does it make the point that the Lord is their God forever? He destroyed their enemies. What kind of enemy, Dan? Wanted to do them harm? The word may... The worst, biggest, baddest enemy ever, okay? Uh, and put it all together here. Go back to what we said at the beginning. Remember that the picture in 38 is a picture of God's promises of bringing the people back to the land, resettling them, uh, making them dwell securely. God ful has fulfilled those promises. But what this whole scene, kind of the question it raises is, well, what if God brings his people back he settles them in the land. He fulfills that promise. But what if another enemy comes along? What if another big bad foe? What if Gog from the land of Magog shows up on Israel's doorstep? What would God do then? And these chapters here show you know, God's going to keep his promise to dwell them securely in the land. He's going to protect them. And in the face of the worst possible enemy imaginable, God is saying, I'm still your God and I'll protect you from harm. Now, what about the nations? Uh, what does God, in the next verse here, uh, what does God want the nations to see and to conclude from all of this with Gog and Magog? His glory? Want to elaborate on that a little bit, Michael, or someone else want to chime in? He wants them to see... Uh that he's in control, um, his power, and it's, it says he, his judgment that he's executed um, specifically. Okay, thank you, Michael. His, his glory, his power, his, his judgment. Ian, you are going to say something about that? Yeah, just that no one can escape ju God's judgment. Okay, no one can escape God's judgment. Brian? Punished for their iniquity, but that he's restoring them and he's sanctifying them and he's putting them in a secure land because they have a covenant relationship with God who is faithful to them, whereas those who aren't in the covenant relationship suffer death, which is again another image of the last day uh, where the evil enter into eternal death and those who are of God's people are sanctified and brought into the kingdom where they dwell securely. Thank you, Brian. So let's make sure we, can, we, we connect this here, okay? Um, what God says he wants the people to, 
to know, the nations know, is, is that I punished Israel for her sins because she forsook me and I was punishing her for her uh, unfaithfulness. So again, connect the dots for me here. How does all this stuff that happened with Gog and Magog, how does it show that Israel was punished for her sins? Connect this back to some of the things we said Sunday about maybe uh, other possible theories about the exile or about God's people having to go to Babylon. What's the connection between the events of, with Gog and his armies and understanding that Israel was punished for her iniquities? Michael? So um, he brought Gog out with, like, well, with hooks and uh, we read that you know, in chapter 38, Israel was unwalled and it was attacked. Um, and uh, I mean, I, so I, it seems like Gog was a judgment on Israel, maybe all right to begin with, um, even though he ended up destroying Gog. Although, it, does it actually say that Gog, Gog uh, did? Harm to Israel, I don't remember that. They don't, and so I think for that reason, we, we would conclude that this is not a judgment. That this is, God is orchestrating this for another reason. But the other, the Babylon captivity, the Babylon attack, that is God's judgment. Okay? Remember we talked about this some on Sunday. What would have been another explanation? What might other nations have possibly said about Jehovah God when they saw Nebuchadnezzar walk into Jerusalem, burn the place down, tear down the temple, and walk away with the people into captivity. What might other nations have said about Jehovah God, just looking at that from the outside? God, the God in Israel is impotent. He's powerless. They might have concluded that from seeing the Babylonian captivity. What does Gog and Magog, what are all these events in 38 and 39, what does this show, prove? Okay. There is no God more powerful than Jehovah. So whatever happened with Israel and Judah being taken into captivity, you look at this with Gog's armies and you say, well, that wasn't because of God's lack of power. It must have been for another reason. And God is saying the, the, the reason was that I was judging them, punishing them for their iniquities. It was not my lack. And we talked about this with the idea of vindication on Sunday, okay? That if after the Babylonian captivity, there is a, an open question about God's character, about his power, about his faithfulness to his people. All these events with with Gog and his armies vindicates God by showing uh, whatever he thought about him before. Now clearly, God is in control. God is all-powerful. God is holy. And his glory uh, and his faithfulness to his people cannot be denied. Okay, So it's like a grand demonstration on the highest level, on the biggest stage, to, to prove this point about God's character. Brian? Observing that we've come this part of the book of Ezekiel to realize that the Jews in Judah appear to me to be as simple as the rest of the nations. As you enumerate their sins, they're horrible, which brought on their punishment. There's consequences for sin. And so I think what we're seeing is there's a difference between God's covenant people, his people who have sinned, and those who are not in God's people who have sinned. And once again, God makes provision for the sins of his people, ultimately in the sacrifice of Christ, and those who have not entered into that covenant perish. I think one of the lessons, I mean, to Brian's point here, think about the repeated phrase throughout Ezekiel, that they will know that I am the Lord. Okay, Over and over again, it's just undeniably uh, demonstrated that this is not about the people. As Brian says, they're in the same boat as everybody else in terms of their sin and their unfaithfulness. Okay? Um, it's not for your sake, he has said over and over again. It's for my name's sake. The nations will know that I am the Lord. So when God punishes evil and when he's faithful to his people, in either case, it's about showing his character, uh, not because of you know the people and their, their character. Yeah, Mike. of parents and their children 
uh, and God and his children. And when it comes to just a parental situation, uh, it's the old deal about I can punish my kids and I will punish my kids, but you ain't going to mess with them. You know, I mean, it's that type of thing. So if, if you're messing with them, it's only because I'm allowing you to, but in the end, I'm going to punish my children yeah. and you aren't going to punish them. And you could, you, could, you could take what's being said here and use that analogy of parents and children and try to put something together that would, you know, uh, would parallel this, right? Your kids have made a mistake, and so you allow something to happen to them in order, because they need it. That needs to be a natural consequence for their mistake, okay? And maybe the kid's thinking, why didn't dad bail me out? Is he not able to? Is he, you know, something else comes along a little bit longer down the road, a much bigger problem, a much bigger difficulty, and you step in and save the day for your kid, then they realize, oh, no, my dad is powerful enough. He is strong enough to help me. That time before when he didn't, oh, that must have been because I needed that or because I deserved it. So that's, you, could, you, could, you could put together some kind of analogy like that uh, to, to see the point that God is making. And we end here uh, in verse 25 to 29. I wish we had more time to talk about it. But uh, uh, a couple of things I'll point out. One Notice the language here finally in Ezekiel about the people forgetting their shame and their treachery. Uh, so far we've seen several places in Ezekiel where the language is used of, of remembering their shame and loathing themselves. And, and there's an appropriate place, as we've talked about that, for remembering the shamefulness of our sin and hating ourselves for that. There's also an element of God's grace, I think we see here in other passages, uh, where he says, no, I will make you to forget that shame to move on completely past it, uh, total restoration, uh, they will be protected, they will be gathered, and then a repetition in verse 29 of what we saw in, in chapter 37 of the Spirit being poured out and given to his people. Uh, that's the ultimate promise there of restoration. Okay, um, so let's see if we can start an argument here. Overview in these two chapters, again in simple terms, Gog is a terrible enemy with a massive army. Yahweh, the Lord, is orchestrating these events to bring the armies against Israel in a very vulnerable state. He is destroying the armies on the mountains of Israel, making them to fall completely without harming his people. Uh, the people get to participate in disposing, and the animals get to participate, uh, in disposing of Gog's armies. They are assured in this promise that Yahweh is their God, and the nations see all of this and understand that God is powerful and that God is holy. So here's the question that's on your handout for uh, number, uh, class number 40 here. Okay. What do we make of all this? And basically, I will say, basically, there are two options. Ezekiel 38 and 39 could be a prediction of literal events that are going to transpire um, in the future at some point. Or... Uh, another option would be that they are, it's simply a metaphor, and there's kind of a general message that's intended to be communicated, um, but these are not literal events that will transpire. Um, so take your pick. Well, maybe we'll do this. Uh, what would you say in favor of the bluish-green box here? What might you say in favor? If you had to argue, I'm not saying you believe this, so it takes all the pressure off. If you had to argue this, uh, or say that these are literal events being predicted, what might you say in favor of that? No, 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 no. We're starting. We're Option is, it's both. It's not either or. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> no need to get violent it's, here, yeah. Mike. You know, it's Nathan's it's not an either or situation. It was the literal events take place, but knowing that God never changes then at the end of time, these same type of events will take place. I think it can be both and not an either or. It's hard to teach good students. I, you know, it's like, it, it makes it challenging. Let's, let's start with the simplistic. Let's, let's forget everything Mike just said. Let's just start, I think, because we'll, we'll maybe make some points here. What would be if you just had to argue that this is a prediction for literal events? What, what would you maybe say in, the, in favor of this? We'll come back to what Mike said. Brian? I, I guess on the other side, I, there, unless it's to happen in the future, relying upon the book of Revelations and other things, 
this event has not happened. There is no record of a literal Gog and Magog or mighty force attacking Israel, unless you want to count the Holocaust um, of the dispersed people during World War II. Um, so if it is a literal event, it's, it's, it still has not been fulfilled. Okay. Wasn't a great argument, if I'm honest, Brian, for, for the, I, I this had, side. I had to back you know, <laughs> High school debate. Didn't you take high school debate? You got to pick a side that you don't agree with and argue with it. Argue with. Although Brian did mention one point that, that'll, uh, that'll be up here. Um, and it is, I think, Brian's comment, as well as Mike's, indicates that it's maybe easier to argue the other side. So I'll, I'll count on you guys to give me some reasons for that. Well, you might just say it's a, it's a kind of most natural or a natural reading of the text. I mean, you're reading through and it says, God says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. In the latter days or after many days, this is going to happen. You read that and say, well, it sounds like he's describing something that's going to happen. So, uh, you know, I'm going to say it's a prediction of, of events that have yet to come. To Brian's point, maybe they haven't happened yet, but it sounds like, uh, hey, after many days, maybe we're still waiting for it. Um, you might say that, hey, there are some visions in Ezekiel uh, in which, you know, Ezekiel's seeing something that's clearly not reality. It's a vision that's, you know, God's showing him. This isn't one of those. Uh, it starts in a fairly straightforward uh, formula in chapter 38, verse 1, uh, that other messages start with. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face towards Gog. Okay, so that sounds like it's simply a message that he has. And then Mike brought this up on Sunday. Brian mentioned it too. Gog and Magog, those names show up in the book of Revelation. And so maybe you would connect that and say that both of these uh, are anticipating some future event. But what would be, if you had to argue the other side, what would be uh, arguments for this simply being a metaphor, Ian? Um, could, could this be, uh, could there be a third option? Could, could this be a prediction of, uh, of uh, sorry, a metaphor for the prediction of literal events. So, like, the metaphor would be, um, you know, all this great imagery. We we clearly see God speaking in kind of like parables and and using a lot of metaphors in Old and New Testament. Jesus did it a lot. Um, it's a way to add kind of a higher meaning to to things that only those who are meant to understand it will understand it. You mentioned revelation, so we, we tie those two things together. And there's no there, there's no historical events like Brian said that, that tie this to a, a literal event. But what if that literal event is a spiritual event, a spiritual battle taking place, and and it is real. We just can't see it. We we can't comprehend it. And and so therefore it it, is, it can be both, because God is is fighting this spiritual battle for us. And, and we're only limited to what we can see and touch here. Okay, I give up. You guys are pushing me toward it, and the class is ending. So um, hopefully these are things you thought of, and we've kind of alluded at them. I mean, I think the fact that 38 and 39 of Ezekiel are so exaggerated, uh, they, they push the limits of what is literally possible, if you want to say that, or feasible. Um, the sequence of events as we described, right, the fact that multiple things are done to dispose of these armies, it's hard to imagine, sort this out, how this would all happen uh, in a literal context. And then uh, we mentioned this, this, some of the symbolism of numbers. This number seven shows up, seven nations, seven years, seven months. Uh, that doesn't have to mean that it's, it's metaphorical, but it does add to this picture of the symbolism going on. Um, so the question then would be this, and Mike's hit on it, and Ian's hit on it as well. Uh, either way, and I would say, I think I put it on your, your handout this way, if it is a metaphor, but even if it's not a metaphor, um, and there are real events that are being anticipated, what is the meaning? Real quickly, maybe just yell some of these out here, because uh, there's something I want to read you real quick before we close. Uh, what would be kind of the, the message that we are supposed to take from this? Whether these are metaphors or literal uh, events, what are we taking from this? God wins. God with a D. That's never that in this chapter. That's important. God with a D, the Lord Yahweh wins. Period. Brian, quickly.
And so, if, thank you, Brian. Ephesians 6, right, we, we wage this battle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers, the forces of darkness in this present age. How does the, the picture of, of Ezekiel 30, how does the picture of Gog's army maybe fit with our battle against uh, the powers of darkness in this present age? Sorry, Gog's armies. Is it? Yeah, yeah. So I just want to show Mike something. I had this prepared, all this stuff here. I did my homework. Mike asked me about it. had all this stuff. I kind of knew we wouldn't get to it. That would be my excuse. Um, but uh, I did do my homework, Mike. I was prepared to talk about Revelation 20, um, but there's not enough time here. Come back in the spring. We'll talk about Revelation in the spring. That's the plan. And uh, so let me just read you this. Um, and I think this will, this will uh, hopefully make some sense. And it, it does. I, I think in the end it is what Mike has said, what Ian has said as well, that I've kind of pro- posed a, uh, you know, a false dichotomy here. We say a prediction of literal events. Well, if we're talking about our, our battle against the powers of darkness, that's a literal event, right? We are literally, just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. We are literally fighting this battle against the powers of darkness of the present age. Okay, uh, so it can be both. It can be a metaphorical, symbolic description of the, uh, the, the warfare that maybe we ourselves are fighting now. But I'm not going to rule out that there isn't something to come. And again, our study of Revelation would maybe bear this out. Uh, that would also fit uh, these descriptions in 38 and 39 that hasn't yet been orchestrated by God yet on the earth. But notice uh, this is from the commentary uh, that I've been using This one paragraph here says, therefore, the message of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not a coded message for those who live in the last days. This is stuff we kind of talked about Sunday. Oh, Gog is Russia or the Soviet Union or Chinese, you know, communist China, whatever. Uh, And so the end must be near. You know, he says it's not a coded message for those living in the last days who by carefully unlocking its secrets will be able to determine the symbolic identity of the key participants in the final struggle. Rather. It is a word of encouragement to all the saints of all times and places that no matter what the forces of evil may do, God's purpose and victory stands secure. If God can defeat the combined forces of Gog and his allies and turn them into fodder for the crows and carrion eaters, how much more can he take care of us, whatever historical manifestation of the enmity of Satan we face. Amen? Couldn't have planned it better. So, uh, if you want to know, know more about Gog and Magog in Revelation 20, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, but for now, we are going to move on and uh, talk about, on Sunday, Ezekiel 40 to 48. We'll do an overview of the last section of the book. So, I'll be reading those chapters in preparation for Sunday's class. Thank you, guys. <laughs>